Hey, we're Pillow Queens and we're at the Live Forever Media Lounge. So I'm Cathy, I am the lead guitarist with Pillow Queens. Um, I'm from Wicklow in Ireland and I grew up in a very musical um, household. Listening to Simon and Garfunkel and Leonard Cohen and just kind of having an L session after school with my folks, like the guitar would always be going or the piano. I'm Sarah, I play bass and guitar and sing in Pillow Queens. Um, I'm from Dublin in Ireland. Didn't come to music till quite late, probably in my kind of mid-teens. And I just, I started skateboarding and listening to pop punk music. Uh, I'm Pamela. I play guitar, bass and sing in Pillow Queens. Being a teenager, I started to, to play gigs as a singer songwriter. And then from there was in a few bands. And yeah, and here we are now. My name is Rachel. I'm the drummer in Pillow Queens. I started off on the guitar. Then my uncle had a drum kit. My brother set it up one day. I got jealous. I was like, oh, I'm gonna play them too. And that's really how that started. Um, so yeah, I've never played guitar in a band. It's always been drums. Uh, I don't like the front. I don't like the spotlight. I'm comfortable in the back, just <laughs> having a little sing. There's a Canadian two-piece, um, twin sisters, Tegan and Sarah, um, that were massive for, I think, all of us growing mm. up. Um, they were two openly queer musicians in a time that that wasn't common at all, in a time, especially in Ireland, that it wasn't a very open society. So it was really cool to see two queer women succeeding in music and seeing them live what seemed like a happy, successful life as queer musicians. I was like, yeah, cool, I want to do that. I think it was when the moment I saw uh, K.E. Tunstall's uh, Jules Holland performance. And then I was like, I need to get my guitar back from the attic and <laughs> just start doing this again because it was just, I don't know what it was but it was just like I really wanted to just start playing music as soon as I saw that performance. We, when we started the band Pamela had kind of stopped playing guitar music and was focusing on different projects and that kind of thing, but I'd always been a massive fan of Pamela's music. Um, I'd kind of, we'd met when we were like 17, 18 kind of time, and I just thought she was an incredible musician. And we became friends after that, and we ended up living together for a summer. And I asked her at the start of our little lease, do you want to start a band with me? And she was like, no, I don't. I don't play guitar music anymore. Like, I don't want to. And it pretty much was like, I just kept banging on her door and being like, do you, are you sure you don't want to start a band? I've got a guitar we, right I here. I have two <laughs> guitars, like we can do that right now. And she was eventually caved and was like, okay, fine. I've got this demo, maybe we could work on that. And then when we started playing together, we're like, this is actually kind of cool. Um, but we had very bare bones demos at that point. Yeah. And we knew that we had to recruit two talented people to join us, yeah. so. Uh, and, and when we say like, obviously it's like, I, in an ideal scenario, it's like, oh, we would like people who kind of have the same experiences as us, so. But at the same time, we, our community is a queer community. So it's not something that we had to really try very hard to yeah. do, you know, to find a drummer that just happened to be a queer, queer woman. Yeah. <laughs> we wanted to tour together with people who had the same interests. So that was kind of a priority more than getting, I don't know, somebody who we knew had like accolades behind them or whatever it was more. We wanted to tour as for friends who were mm. passionate about what we were doing. We knew it was a, a rare thing and why not try to explore it? to be an all like queer women uh, rock band, essentially. So when you guys invited me to play basketball, is that you vetting me not for that? No, not even. <laughs> I was like, I'm feeling manipulated here. <laughs> we, we, it was for your basketball skills, but. Yeah. <laughs> and because I hadn't met you and Pamela had been talking about you for years and you've been traveling and then you came back and Pam was like, well, I invite Kathy. And I was like, yeah, invite everyone. And then we met and I was really intimidated by you because you were good at basketball. I showed up to our first guitar practice without a guitar, so I can't imagine it was a good first experience. But that's like the ultimate like laid back thing. You're just like, whatever, they'll have one for me. By default, we want to be authentic and there's a re relatability thing in there that we don't want people looking at us and being like, 
oh, they're only musicians because they're different and they have all of these things that maybe I don't have. Like we want people to see it as a possibility and like mm. a potential and particularly like young women and young queer women and just because most people you see on the front of music magazines are men and that's always been the case. So you don't really see representation as a young non-man growing up. Yeah. I think it's a perk as well, like, because obviously, like, the the core is like we just want to make good music, and I think it's it, it's a kind of a plus that while we're doing that thing that they kind of going to, towards our dreams of being in a band as a career, that we also have that added thing of like, oh, we're also doing something um, that we're almost unaware of is that people, when people see us, they're like, it, it's important in a way. Um, but I also think it's, uh, you know, we're living in a completely different time. I don't think it's, um, I, I think it's completely different to when maybe we were younger. Uh, I don't think it's, it's not rare. Uh, representation is, is getting better. Like, so eventually I think maybe it will just be something that we won't even ever have to address. People tend to focus a lot on the queerness and, which is great and we want representation, but we do find that it's kind of, that's the focal point an awful lot, so there's less of a conversation about our music. And we're more than happy to talk about it, but it's when people come and see our music where it's we've had like unapologetic for queer women and we're like, yeah, but can you not say that and talk about the guitar tones or like the harmonies or, you know, the actual content of the music. And I think as well when there's you know, when we're selected for big things as a band, there's Maybe maybe it's just an internalized insecurity, um, but that you're like, oh, is this a box ticking exercise? Where you know there's a festival lineup that needs to diversify, so they get pillow queens in. We we'll get four women, yeah. four women, four queer women. For the you price know, of one. It, yeah. the price of one, it's only one booking, one fee, and they've already been like, hey, we're not we're not only booking men, we booked pillow queens. Yeah. As a whole, the music industry probably needs a bit of a refresh, and mm -hmm. we're lucky that we exist in a very small pocket. That's accepting, supportive, encouraging of us as four queer women, but as a whole, you know, like women in, in music are, are hypersexualized and they're critiqued way more than their male counterparts and, and that kind of thing. And we sort of get away with that a little bit. Mm -hmm. We don't, our appearance is never commented on in reviews, whereas like the likes of, okay, Twitter comments are different, right? But like <laughs> in mean, reviews, they wouldn't, but um, I remember there was a, a review I won't be specific, but of, of, a, of a female act in, in Ireland when they played and the whole review was commenting on their appearance and how they looked on stage and it was nothing about the music. And I think that's that's where we need to change, where it's like, it doesn't matter what we look like and it doesn't matter if you're a woman or a man or you're mm -hmm. a queer woman or a man or you're somewhere in between or whatever, that the focus is on the music. I I suppose I can only speak for myself, but I definitely find lyric writing to be a cathartic experience and it's something that I'm doing for me, first and foremost, is I'm processing feelings or experiences and I'm writing about them. I'm not really thinking about the listener. I may be thinking about the gals first, <laughs> so I'm like, they're going to hear first and maybe they're going to think that I'm crazy. Crazy, yeah. <laughs> so I'm trying to think about them and how they're going to perceive it, but um, I'm, yeah, probably thinking about my experiences first, which I think does hark back to authenticity because you're writing from a from from the heart. I, that's really earnest, but it, you know you do. Um, and I think if you don't do that, then it takes the authentic authenticity away from it. Mm -hmm. um, especially if you start thinking about radio or listeners or the industry as a whole or anything like you need to separate that from the writing. This last album and this last kind of experience of writing has been massively collaborative. Yeah. Um, like as I kind of said before, we've been experiencing a lot of the same things together, uh, the four of us. So when we're writing lyrics, it's a lot easier to be like, does that make sense? Is that what I mean? Like, and try and kind of explain mm -hmm. a feeling and then try and put mm -hmm. that into words. And then the music, I think bolsters that as well because it's yeah. like well maybe you'll say that but then the music's going to do that and there's going to be a duality going through there so that will explain that side of things and you're kind of encouraging each other to be like yeah just say that and we'll do that and this yeah mm. massively collaborative like ideas kind of come into the room and then which is great because i can come with the guitar line and that's all i can hear but then like a melody can just amp it up so much mm. you know there's a lot on the new album that when we were like 
kind of writing it, mm -hmm. what came out in the studio was exactly mm -hmm. what we thought it would be. So, like, the first thing that's coming to my mind is there's a song on the album called Delivered, and that was like just something that we just kept on singing over and over and over again, not really having any structure whatsoever, just like that line. Mm -hmm. I've been delivered, I've been delivered. And then eventually it just kind of widened out and widened out and widened out. And when we brought it to the studio, what we what we got was exactly what we all just had in our minds. Mm -hmm. But there's a few on that album, or I think most of them are. I feel like yeah. the whole album for me is exactly what I wanted it to be, yeah. which is such a cool feeling. <laughs> So we were, there was no gigs happening. We'd released our first album and it had gone down really well, but when you can't play the songs live, you're just kind of like, do people really like this? Or is it just stuff written on paper? You know, mm. you don't know. And then kind of getting, I say knocks on the door, but what is it, the emails from your manager being <laughs> like, oh, Sub Pop Publishing want to sign a deal with you. And you're like, that's gotta be a prank. And it just really kind of helped us keep going. It was just tough. I mean, obviously with like, we were supposed to have said by when just everything went into lockdown Funny. two years ago, mm. yeah, yeah, exactly. And that was like the first night things sort of shut down. And um, that was really disheartening, obviously, and we're not alone in that, so that was like a shared experience with everyone. But I think things like, yeah, Sub Pop and Royal Mountain coming along and being like, no, 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 the album's great. Like, we really care about this album. And it just, it, it made So we didn't that. have the benefit of touring the album, I guess, so we didn't actually physically see people reacting to the album so we're like is it being well received is it not and where aren't you all so yeah <laughs> Greds are really good they're amazing yeah. yeah I think we don't expect it to come this far from home and have people speak to us in a way that they've really related to our record which mm -hmm. is our experiences um, but when you speak to people and like even last night and it was you know 1am and the Velveeta rooms yeah. and it was packed and it was the sweatiest gig we've ever played in our entire life and there was people coming up who were Austin they're you know Texas born and bred Austin for the last 23 years and saying you know your record just really spoke to me and I'm like oh, it's surreal like, it's like so, how did it get all the way over here how did you find it and how did you relate to it and like it's so cool it's it's incredible but I think you can really feel that from the crowd when we're playing as well like they're so behind you there's nobody trying to because nobody wants you to mess up. Yeah. <laughs> I think we were nervous as well because coming from Ireland where crowds are quite rowdy yeah. and they let you know how they feel about it. I think yeah. we were kind of like, oh, how are we going to land? But yeah, yeah, everybody's been super supportive yeah. so far. All of the time, all of the time, all of the time. This album in particular, it's very intimate and it's quite um, like introspective as well because when the time it was written, um, you couldn't look outward. So all you could do was look inward. So like a lot of the writing is very like quite vulnerable. Probably getting in your head about things that you would have never gotten in your head about before and using that as inspiration to, to write. It was an album that we wrote very much so to play live because we were optimistic that things were going to open again. And lo and behold, they did, thankfully. Um, very excited to be able to tour it. And yeah, it's an album that was written to be played in packed venues um, potentially yeah. yeah as we as we progress we hope to be playing like bigger stages we, we love that but, but to still we... have the diet of Ireland I think we're very aware is that, as well that even though this is our second album this is our first experience of being able to tour an album um, that we we did get a little bit of our, our, our tour uh, for In Waiting Out of the Way but it was pretty much two years after the fact when it was supposed to happen. So all these experiences are new to us, even though we should be, uh, we shouldn't be as green as we are. Yeah. Um, but uh, so it's it's quite exciting to to have all this happening. Um, so yeah, I think you forget as well. Like I'm only sort of realizing from the last little while that we've been touring. But when you tour, you meet new people, you make new fans, and we've missed that. We've kind of had an album, we had it out. And, we had the reach online, we had the articles, we had the reviews, we had Spotify algorithms reaching people, but we weren't meeting people, we weren't being like, oh, bring your friend to our show, or, you know, people just see this as a show on their town and they come and check it out and then they're a fan, they're a diehard fan forever. Yeah. We've kind of missed out on that part. Yeah. So I'm really excited about people hearing us live and falling in love with the music that way. All of the time. All of the time, all of the time. All of the time.